Hi everybody, this is Tim Schaefer from Double Fine Productions and I have stolen the microphone for this special 100th episode of The Game Maker's Notebook because we're turning the tables on the beloved Ted Price, the usual host of the show. In honor of it being the 100th episode, we are going to ask him the questions. I get to uh, ask him about his early days in games, about the founding of his company, Insomniac Games, and what values and principles have guided the company along the way and how that has evolved over the years to lead them to be um, one of the most respected game studios in the world and also often listed as one of the best places to work. So I'm going to ask Ted about his secret sauce. I'm going to be writing notes and I'm going to be stealing ideas and I hope you will too. So without further ado, here's our talk with Ted Price. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome to The Game Maker's Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Hi, Ted. Hey, Tim. Great to be here with you. This is really fun. You have interviewed me for this exact thing, did a really great job, and now I have to live up to that somehow. But really, the pressure's on you. You're the you're the special guest of honor. That is you nice know. of you to say. Well, I'm, I'm experiencing that terror when you have no idea what somebody's going to ask you, and you're thinking, what are the dumb things I could say that are going to get me in trouble? How do I avoid <laughs> them? But let's That's just go with it. Go That's with what it. we're going for. I've been talking to all your high school friends and enemies finding out the worst things. Um, why don't you just go over them again, though, just to refresh my memory, the most <laughs> embarrassing things that have happened to you? In your- well, when I was five, I, no, okay. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I would love to talk about things um, both in the present and in the past a little bit. We had a fun time, I don't know if you remember, coming to Double Fine and playing uh, Spyro and Ratchet in our office. Vividly, vividly. <laughs> that was so much fun because you actually, I recall you provided... <laughs> A lot of uh, insight and commentary that I had never thought about with Spyro uh, when we were playing, <laughs> and uh, you are a consummate entertainer. Not to just you know throw out abject flattery, but uh, it was fun because I don't have to be creative because you're doing it, so it works. <laughs> <laughs> this interview is getting off to a great start. I like where this is going. Yeah, Ted, compliments. Um, well, you have created a lot of entertainment for a lot of people over the years, so I I know you know uh, what goes into it. I um. I, that's one of the fun things about uh, talking to you is that we've been through a lot of similar situations, but different. It's kind of like, have you ever looked at an adult friend's high school yearbook and been like, I know that guy. I know that guy. You don't really know that person, but, oh, there's that popular guy. And they're like, they have correspondence in your world, but they're slightly different, you know? Parallel you know, universes we, for sure. Yes. We started our studios similar time. What, what year would you say? We were 94. Oh, wait, never mind. Much earlier. That's right. You had a whole a whole game on us. <laughs> well, there wasn't much going on. I mean, we were we were focused on Disruptor, which was a PlayStation 1 game. We actually started as a 3DO game. And in That's the right. middle of production, yeah, the 3DO tanked. And we had to shift gears really fast. But at the time, there were maybe five of us by the t- when we shipped Disruptor. And then mm-hmm. we dropped down to maybe four or three of us. And aren't we're, some of those people still with you? Well, Al Hastings and Brian Hastings, yeah. my partners yeah. from the very beginning, are still at Insomniac, still rocking. And a lot of other folks who joined during Spyro the Dragon are actually still at Insomniac as well. So yeah. it's it's been nice to have continuity for 27 years. <laughs> That's the other thing that we have in common. We have a lot of employees that have been around for a lot, or partners that have been around for a long time. And in our case, it's just that we have something on them, of course. We have some blackmail materials that we can force them to stay put. But in your, I was going to really ask your idea. secret. What is your secret for uh, making people not get tired of you? How do you do that? I, uh, <laughs> I just try to hide, and mm-hmm. that way they don't get tired of me. Brilliant. Avoid just social interactions. Lay low. Yes, exactly. <laughs> don't. Are you don't actually. Need- are you actually an introverted person, would you say? You know, it's funny. That's a great question. I I think I'm naturally, I'd prefer to be introverted. introverted. I would, uh, if you gave me a choice uh, about whether to go to a party or stay home and work on stuff, I would 100% of the time want to stay home. <laughs> but I don't think your or my jobs allow us to be introverts. We have <laughs> to, you know, meet people. We have to listen. We should uh, be there for other folks. Right, it's a key part. So, as a, I guess, work-wise, I tend to be very extroverted. 
uh, private in my regular non-work life, I'm I consider myself introverted. And so after all the meetings, you just have to go home and lay down. It absolutely, it's exhausting. <laughs> Being social, at least for some people, for me in particular, takes a lot out of me. And uh, I've tried to explain that to my wife frequently, and she she says to me, "What's your problem? It's great." Yeah. <laughs> It's a, the industry is full of people with all different uh, shades of that. You know, I think there's some who really, you saw, I think quarantine really brought it to the forefront. You know, there's some people who um, being away from people is, is really hard on them. And some people kind of are like, this is what I've always wanted. This <laughs> is having no plans, having uh, nothing I have to do. I totally agree with that. And uh, I feel like there were a lot of folks who prior to the pandemic at Insomniac wanted that and would ask, can we, can we work remotely? And until the pandemic, we didn't, I didn't really have a good perspective on how positive an experience, uh, having that flexibility could be for folks, including myself. I actually really want to ask you about this because this gets into, I would love to know if you have thought about what is your very first inclination of video games? Like the first foggiest memories of your childhood where you became aware of video games existing. Do you remember any of that or the first experiences you had playing them? There were, well, there really were two that stick out as being wow moments where I felt that joy that you get when you're diving into anything, whether it's a video game or a book or a movie or some a sport, and you feel that sort of rush. And it was the first time I went to a friend's house and they had gotten a Magnavox Odyssey for Christmas and they fired up they fired up the console and we played Pong. And I, had, I hadn't seen a video game before then. And I was just sucked in and, and couldn't, couldn't leave until my mom dragged me away. And this, the second, and actually my friend ha was, um, uh, had older siblings as well. And so I think that was really the reason that they had it. But the, the, second, the second experience, which was even stronger for me, was going to a movie theater and playing Space Wars, the, the arcade version of Space Wars, a stand-up cabinet. And what really sucked me in was how smoothly the spaceships moved and how well they responded to the input. I mean, just mm -hmm. there was no lag whatsoever. And I didn't have a whole lot of experience with lag at all, but it just felt like I was part of the machine. And at that moment, I, it took me it made me realize how magical, you know, games were. And what was even cooler was a few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to the Smithsonian and watch the original, eight of the nine original creators of Space Wars get up on stage and talk and talk mm -hmm. about their experiences programming the very first PDP version of the game that came out, PD, sorry, it was on a PDP-80, maybe. It, it was a very old machine in the 60s. Anyway, they were all up there discussing how they managed to do it and sneak the game creation uh, as they were supposed to be doing other things. Like they were working in a computer lab and they weren't supposed mm -hmm. to be working on games, but they made it. And it was ostensibly the very first video game ever. And these guys were and are in their 80s and 90s. And it was humbling to listen to their perspective of how you deal with just less, maybe less than a K of memory, whatever it was at the time, <laughs> they had amazing constraints, but they managed to create this uh, enduring video game with their yeah. crazy constraints. And what about the, the fact that they didn't, they were making something they didn't know, like you and I knew video games existed when we started making video games. They're, they're making something like, what is this? We don't even know what we're making. Exactly. I can't remember how they describe their pre- Space Wars experience, other than I think they had all had an interest in games of some form, whether it was chess or board games. Board or, games. Yeah. yeah. And and all of them were interested in computer graphics, you know, to the extent computer graphics existed. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, that's that's, that's you know, we have a lot fantastic. a lot of folks to thank for where we are today. Exactly. And I love hearing that you mentioned the the Odyssey, because that's mine too. That's my first memory is my dad brought home this Magnavox Odyssey. And I'm still learning stuff about games. I feel so dumb. I thought Pong, I thought Pong existed first in, in the arcades, and then the Odyssey was just the home version of it somehow. But the Magnavox Odyssey was where Pong like that came first. Before think, before the arcade machine. cabinet versions. I thought so. I, th I yeah. think that's right. 
that was a big surprise for me because you know Atari gets all the credit for that, you know, and, and putting that in. But hopefully, we'll we'll fact check this podcast before we put that up. But uh, I think that was, we, or we will be fact checked. Yeah, Max yeah. Bear and the Magnavox Odyssey, um, and it just I I tried to explain, you know, kids today. No, I tried to explain how um, just seeing pixels on a screen that were moving under your control was such a um, blow, blew our minds because like we're so used to. TV as a passive thing and TV, you don't, you never can, you can change the channel and that's it. Um, and this is like, I'm moving these sprites on, I'm moving this pong paddle. This is amazing. Yeah. You know, and the overlays, the plastic overlays you'd put on to get the great graphics, <laughs> oh, man, so it's so much fun. Um, so then like these early creators didn't know that there was a potential industry. Maybe they had an inkling, but by the time you, when was the first time you remember thinking or did you ever think when you were a younger person that I could do this for a living? It was after I graduated from college and I had been working at a startup medical company that my uncle had founded. And I was lucky enough to get a chance to do some programming there, uh, programming their market research databases and doing some work on, on their IT systems and realized that I wasn't particularly passionate about medicine. I really liked the company. But I, it wasn't something that I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I started thinking about what, what, what I got excited about. And I got excited about solving problems. I got excited about coding. And I also got excited about 3D graphics because at the time I was also trying to make money as a freelance 3D artist by doing box covers for Logitech products. I don't <laughs> know if I, I haven't told a lot of people about this, but I actually I was able to build, yeah, uh, build and render, I think it was a, F15 or something for one of the Logitech controllers. And they paid me a couple hundred bucks for it. And I thought, yes. <laughs> there's a cover for a Logitech project that has a fighter jet flying flying on it. And that's yours. I think, yes. That's what I recall doing. Okay, yes. I got to look that up. Uh, and, <laughs> will it have your signature style on it? Will it be like uh, striped and have ears? And, uh, so, like and, big, and big, big googly eyes. Yes. Because, <laughs> you know, realism, whatever. You know, who cares about realism? But the at, at that time, what I really wanted to do was make enough money somehow to buy a much more powerful computer. And and at the time, you know, the movie industry had was was pushing VFX in a huge way. I think Lawnmower Man was out at that point, and it was you know, this this idea that you could have believable. 3D graphics in your movies was super cool. And what what were they using? Well, they were using silicon graphics workstations. Mm -hmm. And I, in my naivete, thought, well, if only I had an SGI, yeah. then I would I be do. even more awesome. And so I figured I, I looked at the price tag, which I think at the point at that point they were between sixty and eighty thousand dollars per mm -hmm. per machine. And then you had to get the license for Alias Wavefront which was a precursor to Maya, which was another 60 K or something. And I thought Psh, you know, that's, there's no way I can do this unless I figure out a way to make more money than I'm making now. So what am I going to do? Hey, I like video games and I really wish I, I I'd love to design a video game and put these, these skills that I think I have, which were absolutely not really particular. They weren't skills. They were just wish, wish lists really to use making a video game. So I, be left the medical company, I was doing additional programming for them as a consultant, and I saved up enough to buy not a Silicon works, Graphics workstation, but a better PC and a 3DO dev station because uh, 3DO had just announced their existence and were asking people if they were <laughs> interested in making games. And I raised my hand. And I said, yeah, I want to make games. And uh, that's how, at least for me, it started. Yeah. But to, to go on, and sorry, I'll, I'll, sh I'll shut up after a second. But I, this is all about you not shutting up. So it's <laughs> the next thing I did was like, I, I started asking around if, if anybody I knew had other folks who'd be interested in doing this. Mm -hmm. And my mom said she had met a friend whose son went to my alma mater, whose roommate was an absolutely brilliant programmer, and I should meet him. And so... And the guy's name was Al Hastings. And so I gave him a, I was out in California in San Diego in my one room office with wearing a tie, trying to program a, a game. And I gave Al a call completely out of the blue in his dorm room and explained what I was trying to do. And I think he said something like, yeah, it sounds pretty cool. 
And <laughs> that was the extent of our conversation. And Flash he, forward for 30 years. It, well, actually, well, he, he actually agreed to, to probably dr- drop a lot of very lucrative job offers and come out to mm. California and joined. And we made our, the demo for our first game. And the, second, the next thing we did was we called Al's brother, Brian Hastings, who was working at Siemens, the pacemaker company, and he came on and joined us. And you know, the, the last part of this is that both Al and Brian are brilliant programmers. So mm-hmm. any hope that I have or had of ever programming was, was sort of a, a foolish hope. So I took a step back and they rocked it while I pretended to do other things. And uh, <laughs> it was great. It worked out. I like how your version of the story makes it sound like you contribute nothing to these games. But I feel like that's <laughs> not true. Or we would not be talking to you today. I don't, well, you know what? The reality is, I mean, you know this because you've been doing it for so long. It's a lot of us contribute what we can. And for me, it was mostly doing our, doing my best to keep things going, like asking, you know, okay, what's our next step? What should we do? And, and putting, putting together what was hope, a plan and then filling in the gaps if I could, like doing art or audio or, or whatever, or participating in design. But I, I've never had a, a skill I've been trained in that I could really apply well to games. And I've been very lucky to, to be surrounded by people who are real crass people. And I tend to draft off of that and it, it works pretty well. I mean, that's often the advice that, you know, I give and a lot of people give, which is the secret to success is to surround yourself with great people and, and, and get out of the way. You just, I've had still struggle with getting out of the way. That's a difficult thing to do. You, <laughs> know, you want to be in the sandbox, having fun with everybody else. Look at all the fun they're having. You wanna... Exactly. I, I agree. I mean, that creative uh, melange that is development for all of us is such a fun place to be when you see everybody's light bulbs going off and, and people are collaborating on crazy ideas that seem impossible at first, but then, you know, a few days, a few weeks later, uh, mm-hmm. show up on the screen. Like mm-hmm. those are, that's one of the things that makes game development so exciting for me. Yeah. And though I was going to ask if you remember the last time you, uh, crafted anything in polygons or if you were even like not for for either for one of the games or just on the side like do you still pursue any of these interests as a hobby i do i do i i I still spend a lot of time now in houdini i I love procedural proceduralism so i will uh do experiments for myself just in effects or build uh, models and render them in redshift just part partly because i want to keep up with what's happening outside of our industry in terms of 3D, because mm-hmm. it's always been a passion of mine. And I also have this sort of irrational belief that someday I'll be a decent 3D artist, but that just takes so much focus. So I, I, I will dive in, I'll do something and I'll show it to my kids and they'll laugh and then I'll get demoralized and then I'll get back to it a couple months later and try again. So that's that's sort of my fits and starts. I was going to ask, are you sharing these anywhere? Do you have no. an Instagram account for all these great <laughs> renders? Oh my God, no. no Under a secret identity, maybe? No. That's a great idea. It's an excellent idea. Yeah. Uh, but no, the last time I, I contributed m- meaningfully to any project of ours from an art perspective was probably R- Ratchet & Clank 1, where mm-hmm. I animated and I think did some, maybe I built some of the models for our Gadgetron interface because mm. at the time I think we needed, nobody was available to do it. So I just said, oh, okay, I'll do it. That's and right. nobody, you know, minor part of the game. So it didn't really matter if it's- No, that thing flips out in 3D and comes to life. That's a great interface. You remember that? Oh my we, God. We, so we talked about it during the devs play at, on Double Fun. Wow. You were like, I animated that. And I was like, oh, that's really good. That's, that's right. really nice. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because that's always a that's always a um, a struggle between you know if you're gonna if you're running a company you don't want to be a bottleneck. So you know I still am an individual contributor as they say by doing writing the dialogue, and then often I'll be the bottleneck on the team. And so I'm trying you know, that how much where do you where do you split your time or where where are you best um, figure out where your time is best spent when you're running companies is tricky because you you got into this for 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 some passions that you had and. Um, and in the end, it seems like you have shifted to your passion as being kind of enabling other people to do great work and like making things like keeping that that show going, you know? Yeah, you're right. And I, I you're absolutely right about the bottleneck issue. Uh, I think that every founder or uh, person who's in charge of a group has to realize that if if they're trying to balance building content 
and managing a team effectively, it's a tough balance to achieve. And it creates a lot of stress, not just for you, but for your team. I realized I was a bottleneck back on, I think it was uh, resistance one where I was trying to do, be a creative director, run the company and just pissing off a lot of people. So <laughs> that's, that's where I took, that's the first step I took back. And I've continued to take step back, steps back from it uh, up until even more recently where I stepped out of production almost altogether, realizing that my focus needs to be on culture almost, almost entirely as we've grown. Because the bigger we've gotten as a company, the more, uh, the more challenges there that exist just in terms of keeping the organization functioning efficiently, making sure that people are being taken care of, making sure that we're doing all the things that folks expect us to in terms of career pathing and uh, managing workloads and ensuring that folks aren't burning out. That's, that's really important for us as a company and for me. It's a new. It's been a. It's been a really fun challenge to work with others on coming up with solutions to help people again, sort of enjoy what they do and you know, mm-hmm. remove the roadblocks to creativity. That that is ultimately our all of our jobs. I think as leaders in a creative business. Yeah, that's great. Let's talk more about that because I think that's really interesting. Because you're Insomniacs always are really highly rated as a place to work, and you had some people who worked for you obviously many, many, many years. So it's just obviously something that you are doing right. And um, can we talk about, when you talk about your culture, especially, um, have you noticed that ever going through different phases? Maybe as you've grown, there was a different eras of, of the culture and has that, um, are you still learning things about it now? And also, have you ever tried to distill your culture into like a couple of words? Because that's an exercise people go through sometimes when they're giving presentations and they're like asking themselves, who are we? And they try and really distill it. Have you ever gone through all that? Uh, yes and no. So. I mean, I'll start start from the, the your last question. Distilling your culture into one word is challenging. In fact, even defining what culture is 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 hard to do. And I've thought a lot about that lately. And I haven't. I don't have a good answer other than it is the people. It is the people at your company. It's how they. It's what they believe, how they feel, and and what allows everybody to work together happily and effectively. Like those are all sort of soft statements, but they all. I think. The, the result is who you are as a team. Uh, and we have gone through phases for sure to answer one of your other questions uh, when it comes to our culture. I think early on, I didn't know anything about building culture. It just happened mm-hmm. as we went from a very small number of people to a medium size to a larger size. And along the way, through running into brick walls with our, with happiness or morale or other issues, we had to solve cultural problems. And, and one of the first was establishing structure at the company. Like prior, when we were about 25 people, 30 people, we really didn't have much structure. We didn't have departments. We just, everybody kind of worked together on teams. And I was trying to do a lot of the leading from leading projects to setting milestones to doing finance and HR, that was just dumb. And all of us who were ostensibly in charge and working together said, okay, let's just build some structure. Let's have some departments. Mm-hmm. And that was that actually in itself changed our culture the day we did that because people started identifying as much with their groups, their, de- their departments as they did the company or the project they were working on. So it, it, it changed the feel. Uh, more recently, as we've grown and become part of Sony, we've also realized that we are part of a larger culture. And you know, we have to, we ask the question: How can we, how can we be a good, you know, a good collaborator and peer in this culture, but also maintain our own culture? So we've spent a lot of time digging into at, at Insomniac um, how we continue to maintain our identity uh, as you know, a developer who makes certain types of games and has a certain uh, environment. And that environment for us to, to keep on going on this train of thought mm-hmm. uses is, is, I think, characterized by a, a few words, transparency, collaboration, uh, communication. All of those things have been really important to us from the very beginning and have become even more important as we've grown. And as an example... Uh, when I when I say transparency, 
one of the things I like to do is answer an AMA every single day and ask me anything question. And I, from the company, from, from anybody in the company. So folks will email me and just ask anything from an innocuous question to a really hard hitting, sometimes brutal question. And honestly, or with their name on it, with their name on it. Okay. So at, at one point, and actually that's a great question. Uh, in the past, we did have anonymous questions and for, I'd say the first four years, oh gosh, I don't know. We've been doing it for a long time, many years. Um, I can't remember how many years, but the challenge with anonymous questions was that I would often need context. I couldn't answer a question fully without understanding sometimes what was asked. And with hundreds of people in the company, everybody has a different approach to answering questions, asking questions. So I changed, I, I let everybody give everybody lots of heads up and said, Hey, we're going to change this. I I'm asking you to put your name on the questions so I can follow up with you. And it's been great because now I can answer pretty much any question fully without misinterpreting the question by being able to have follow-up with the folks who are answering. But anyway, to the point yeah, that's of, interesting. of AMA. I'm just writing notes because I'm stealing all of this for, I'm stealing all of it. Just, <laughs> I, I please, hope, please be specific. Well, I, I think it's great <laughs> if, if everybody is willing to answer the hard questions within their teams or, or companies, because most of the problems I think exist from misperceptions about what's really going on. Yeah. And often those in charge, like me or other people who are leading teams, make assumptions about what others know. And those assumptions are, I, in my opinion, are driven by what we know. I'm, I'm going, well, why wouldn't everybody know what's in my head? Exactly. Uh, well, they don't. And creating a vehicle that allows people to ask whatever they want without fear of repercussions is, re to me, is really important. So that, again, folks can feel it's A, okay to ask anything, and B, I'm going to find the answer. I'm going to get the answer, the truth about this thing that I'm interested in, whether it's maybe it's sales numbers. Maybe it's why we have a certain policy. Maybe it's why this thing happened that really pissed me off last month. And God damn it, I want an answer, right? Those are the, all of those are fair game. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the leader's responsibility, in my opinion, to, to put himself, put themselves out there and answer those questions. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's just an example. I, I think that's really, that's been one way we try to keep things very transparent and, and responsive at Insomniac. How many do you get a day? I only get maybe one or two a day, if okay. that. Uh, sometimes I, they're flood in, sometimes I get a dry spell, but I queue them up. So I have a big kind of list of yes. questions. And I don't, to be fair, I don't answer them all. I, I will, if I'm not if, equipped to answer the question, maybe it's a question about one of our projects and one of the characters and will we use this other character eventually yeah. the creative director answers that so i just send it off and yeah delegation yeah. yes the secret <laughs> that's awesome that's i I'm, i've slipped into the mode of just like trying to trick you into giving a gdc talk on running a company so that i can steal this yeah steal all your ideas <laughs> i should say dice talk let's well, edit that <laughs> some, something else you you mentioned though that i i do want to i want to point out you asked if there was um Asked about, you know, if there's a word we use or I think a phrase mm -hmm. or you said something like that. We actually, we do have a vision at Insomniac and that's to create games that have a lasting and positive impact on people's lives. Hmm. That is something that we did not have for many, many years. We didn't have a mission statement. We didn't have a vision statement. And thanks to a bunch of people uh, asking, hey, why are we here? <laughs> why are we yeah. doing what we do? Uh, we were able to, collaboratively come up with that statement. And, and it wasn't the first one either. Our yeah. first mission, our first vision statement was a bust because, and I can't, I can't remember what it was. Make but, the world best games. Most. <laughs> well, actually it was something, it literally, it was something like that. We're going to make oh, like that. the best yeah. games ever. Yeah. And it sounded, it didn't sound aspirational and sound a little inauthentic. Of course, everybody wants to make the best products ever. What yeah. is it? And, and it, what we all had to ask ourselves was what's meaningful really meaningful to us. Why, did, When we die, like what do we want people to remember about us? That we made great games? Well, the insomniacs that I talked to uh, answered, no, we, we actually want to make the world a better place. That's, mm -hmm. and it, it sounds, you know, it, it, yeah, lofty. it sounds lofty and, and sometimes it can sound cheesy, but, but when we dig deep and we think about legacy, I, I, I believe a lot of people tend to feel that way. You know, what are we yeah. doing to improve the lives of others? And we're making games, right? Yeah. So, to answer that question, to 
and, and to acknowledge that we can make lives better, we actually have to ask a lot of questions about our games and our stories and use that vision to, to help us make tough calls on the types of games we're making and the decisions that our characters make in the game and the themes that we have in our games. And it has been really useful over the last few years in particular, as we've been, you know, putting out games that a lot of people play, fortunately, uh, because we can be honest with ourselves and go, okay, yeah, we actually did have a positive effect on this person. Look at what they're saying about say Miles Morales or, yeah. or the story in Ratchet and Clank or, you know, whatever it is. And it's, and that's, that makes the hours, it makes the stress, it makes it all worthwhile. Yeah. I imagine you must hear from people who talk about special times they've had playing games with, you know, relatives who have passed on or had gotten through a tough time. I'm sure you've gotten messages like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know you have too. I'll share that um, <laughs> many of my family members. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. I have to mention this. My, my uh -oh. third daughter is dying uh, for sequels to all of your games, new sequels, all because she's played them all and she really <laughs> wants them. Nice. So she she wanted she pro made me promise that I would ask you um, to just all of them. That's a lot of work. Pretty much, pretty much all of them. Yeah, she doesn't <laughs> she doesn't she didn't want to pick one. Okay, all right, I'm sorry. That's probably an irrational ask, but can you please do it? <laughs> okay, I'll get on that after this after this interview. But yeah, yeah. okay, that's great. I mean, that's, I think that's great to have that kind of, because um, there's certain decisions you make, uh, you, you need some sort of device to help you pick one thing over another when you're you're doing your content. And and I think also there's a lot of things in games that people would consider like soft goals, like oh, we want to have our games be more diverse or like, you know, they don't like, because the hard goals are like, we have to be performant on this machine. Da, 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 da. And so for years we've been talking about, sometimes it's harder to get things in, um, that can't be quantified, you know, it's harder to, and I don't mean that's that obviously diversity is not a soft goal, but it's like, it's harder to show when you're arguing with a publisher about why that increases sales, you know, it's like, it's like, it's, um, it's, it's a holistic thing. And it's just, but once you've really instilled it, it's like, this is what my company cares about. This is what this is part of like who we are. We care about this, this topic. Then, um, then people kind of realize like, oh, we're doing this intentionally. We're, we're having this character be this way intentionally because it it helps support our values as a company. Uh, well, that's that's a great point, Tim. Supporting your values as a company is another way that I think a vision statement can really um, have impact. Like because it isn't it isn't just about the games. It is about for us at least saying that we create games that have a lasting and positive impact on people's lives also refers to Insomniacs. So if we're the creation process itself and the culture that we have at Insomniac should make Insomniac slides better. So when we make the decisions about policies or how we you know, structure things at Insomniac, that has to, the answer has to be, well, it's improving things for the team. Yeah. So we went through the first second on this game had a really grueling crunch mode, really, um, like in, I, I can't believe I, they didn't murder me because we, we were working and part of it was we were trying to save the company, you know, as one of those, you know, indie games like roller coasters. And, um, but afterwards we, everyone stayed on and I was so amazed and touched that everyone, you know, didn't leave with that really hard crunch mode that we all were like, never again, we're going to read a bunch of books on production mythology. We're going to learn about scrum. We're going to just do whatever we can to learn how to not have crunch mode, how to deal with deadlines better and things like that. Um, and I'm sure every company goes through this. And if you're, your company being highly rated by its employees is a place to work. And with so many, you must have successfully uh, grappled with some of these same issues. Right. And, and how's that gone for you? Well, I don't think we've, I don't think we have overcome the challenge of crunch. I don't, I don't know of any company that has, you know, our, our goal is to, to minimize crunch and to increase well being among insomniacs and to reduce burnout. Like those things are all connected. And a lot of it, we, we are now asking insomniacs regularly, what are the things that burn you out? Mm -hmm. What creates, what creates stress in your life that is connected to, or, or not connected to insomniac. So we do regular surveys and we're looking, we're actually tracking the results to understand if internal or external, uh, events have cre in increased burnout or have decreased burnout. And at the same time, we collect specific responses from insomniacs who say, well, this particular thing is burning me out. And it's pretty awesome because 
we can slice it by department, we can slice it by project and see where the stressors really are. Uh, yeah. And and with that in mind, the, the reason we do that, one of the reasons we do that is because this year for the first time in 27 years, we actually have company goals and <laughs> surprising, right? It's, it's strange because you seem to have achieved a lot of things, but <laughs> yeah, it's, now you're now you have goals. <laughs> now we have goals. Yes. Prior to prior to this year, it was more about we got to ship these games and, and uh, try to keep people happy. And but we uh, it was a really good exercise for us as a company to go through to come up with a concise set of goals that would reflect what it is that we truly want to do. And the most important goal, at least for me, of our three is to specifically uh, reduce burnout and increase well-being. And that means we are taking very specific steps to ensure Insomniac stay healthy through what is absolutely a grueling process of shipping games. And mm -hmm. one of the very specific things that we're doing to tackle that, because you can say these things all day long, but unless you have, if, unless you have processes you're putting in place to, to back up what you're saying, it's, it's hot air. So for us, one of the things we're, we've done is made a real commitment to bringing in more people managers, folks who are dedicated specifically to the health of their team members. They are not working on critical path tasks. They are not uh, getting distracted by uh, things that have to be delivered for a particular deadline. They are they are focused on career pathing for their folks. They are asking constantly, "How is your workload? Can I help you balance it?" Uh, they are being that glue between departments, so that if somebody is is not getting what they need, they can step in and help. And they're having, and this is probably the most important part: face to face, one on one meetings frequently with every single member of their team. Now mm -hmm. we haven't. This is in progress, and so we have we don't have enough people managers to cover all of Insomniac, but that is our goal. And it is, I know in the places where we have been bringing on more folks who can do it or elevating folks who are interested in it, it is making a positive difference. And it is what it, what it, it's even more importantly, it's what Insomniacs were asking for as well as a solution to issues with scope control and end of project stresses and you name it. Yeah. And so you're talking about more than just a department head or like head of the art department. You're doing a, a lower level, so they have fewer people that they're taking care of in that way. Yeah, exactly. As because as you know, if you've got if you're trying to oversee or help 20 people, you're you only have so much time. And if you want folks to feel like they really are cared for and and you care about them, uh, I, I think there's a limit to the number of people you can really manage well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, manage, this is the thing that gets me too. I don't know how you feel. Maybe you can tell me how you feel about this, but the word manager, unfortunately has occasionally negative connotations because I hear people talk about middle management and yeah. how larger management. Man, and, and the management. That's right. Those, that, those people in the ivory tower who are making all those decisions. Yeah. Uh, it's, I wish there was a better word and I haven't, maybe. You yeah, haven't. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, suggest the caretaking. I think that yeah, or any exactly. caring at all. It's, it's, it sounds more like sheep herder than it does a uh, tender, a uh, sheep tender. <laughs> that is a great distinction. Yes. And we're not talking about the herder. We're talking about somebody who's the tender, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that's really all great. I got all distracted writing down notes for a thing. I got to talk to some people about these ideas. These are really good. These are, it's all very, really thank, uh, very helpful. Thank you for letting me record this by the way. Cause <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, this, uh, this is where, this is, I think we need in the industry, we need to talk about these things much more frequently it's, and as culture, it's culture, sharing cultural uh, wins and losses in each of our companies, because all of us have gone through the ups yeah. and downs of discovery and, and making, taking wrong steps and then figuring out solutions. Yeah. And you and I, if you don't mind me mentioning this, you and I were once on a mailing list in fact, for still on, I tested it out a few minutes before this that. interview. Yeah. In the early, early days of our companies, we were on a mailing list of other people, um, like the Bioware doctors and uh, well, maybe I shouldn't name names, but uh, a lot of the usual suspects of people who had companies starting at the same time. And, um, and you're just talking about sharing inputs on culture. And the thing that struck me on that list was like, we were all kind of, it was fun to be there and supporting each other in a way, but also I don't know if anyone really ever let their guard down on that mailing list. Like we're all like, you know, Oh, I'm starting a company. This is what this is. We have a great benefits package. Our t-shirts are cool. <laughs> There's a little bit of that. And maybe that was just because we were at an age where we're all proving ourselves with our companies, but it was very hard to say, like, I don't, I don't know if anyone on that, on that list ever said like here, you know, we had this problem. 
here's yeah. the problem that we had, you know, and, and the thing is, we were all having probably similar problems, you know, exactly. mostly, but uh, it would be interesting to have that same list with people who've been through it for, for a while and have nothing to lose for sharing like <laughs> well, i well it's i agree I, maybe we're all at the point in the industry now where we can do that um and it's still challenging in an age where it's easy for things that you say to be misrepresented pretty readily right you mean like if you say it if you tweet it yeah exactly yeah. so or somebody said i heard so and so say yeah. And then it is without context, it can be um, twisted, et cetera. And that's a, that's a tricky one. Mm -hmm. I will say that on a positive note, um, since we are now part of Sony, it has been wonderful exchanging ideas openly with other studio heads and leaders across Sony, just because to your point, we all have the same challenges, but there've been a lot of, for me, a lot of aha moments when I hear uh, somebody like Tara, who runs uh, London Studio, say, well, here's how we do things. Or Angie, who runs Gorilla, say, yeah, here's a solution that we we implemented to solve this problem. And it's great. You know, it's, a, it's a free exchange. I imagine at Microsoft, you guys do. Yeah. So once again, this is the other high school yearbook thing where you're mentioning these names. And I'm like, we got one. We got one. I meet with the other studio heads uh, at Xbox. And I'm like, and we are definitely very, a lot more... Um, open and, uh, you know, about, you know, his struggles that we've had and how we overcome them, you know, especially, you know, maybe COVID had this big, uh, humbling effect on everybody where we're like, how are you dealing with working at home? How are you, you know, um, we're all just happy to be, I mean, I, I'm happy to be alive and, uh, still have jobs, you know, in a time that was so hard for so many people, you know, that yeah. maybe that's why, but we're all, but it's, yeah, very similarly you get a lot of support from our, our friends, uh, and, uh, and Xbox. So I know you've probably been interviewed a lot about that, that acquisition and, and uh, how that relates to the phases of, of the company. And I, um, what can I ask about that, that you could actually talk about? Cause this is all, but uh, um, let's see, what has someone asked you about that? Cause a lot of people probably ask you like, why, why did that happen? And I, no, not really. <laughs> no. Oh, Hey, so why, uh, why did that happen? Cause I bet when you started out, you must, did you think about becoming acquired in like the first year or so of the company? Was that Never. a goal? Did you? <laughs> yeah. Or, and did you ever have thoughts about the opposite? Like I'm never going to sell. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. In fact, I was, I think I was probably uh, young and foolish and said things such as we're always going to be independent. We would never be part of a larger company. Maybe I didn't, maybe I wasn't as strong as that, but I, I definitely gave off that vibe in interviews early on when people would ask, Hey, are you part of Sony? Or are you going to be part of, are you thinking about selling your company to something else? And I would go, no, of course not. We're independent. And when, as the years passed and as we had more experiences with other publishers and continued working with Sony at the same time on games, uh, the differences between approaches be became really clear. And at the, and on a different, a different way of saying this is, I think for, for me and for all the insomniacs, the alignment of our philosophies with Sony became more and more obvious. Uh, we, we worked and have worked really, really well together for close to 25 years because we've taken the same approach to the way we think about development, uh, the way we think about culture, the way, uh, how, how our belief in equality and many, many, many things. Mm -hmm. And so it has always been a natural fit to work together. And when the opportunity arose to become part of Sony, it was, it was almost a no brainer. So mm -hmm. um, part of it also is that you know, this industry is, as you know, is just getting uh, more and more mm -hmm. challenging in terms of the resources <laughs> necessary Dynamic. to make a game. Dynamic. There you go. That's a very friendly, <laughs> friendly way to say it. Uh, and, and having a partner who is a powerful, large partner who you know, immediately reaches millions and millions of, of players with their hardware and other games is great. Uh, but I think going back to something else I said earlier, being part of that, that having that peer group, uh, other studios who do things that are very similar to our stuff is great. And being able to talk unreservedly with them about just ways that we can improve and share is another wonderful benefit of being part of a, a larger group like Sony. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think either, either one of us 
because we didn't intend to be acquired at any point in the early days, would have done it in, unless we felt a very trusting relationship had built up where we also didn't believe that that large entity would change us, you yeah. know, or like come in and change our culture or change anything, you know, it would just take away that, uh, the constant thinking about money. Oh, that, that is a, you know, it's a, that's a really important point. I, I agree with that, Tim, because I think that I'll, I know at Insomniac, people were worried that our culture would change by being part of Sony. And, you know, a lot of our discussions hinged on the importance of maintaining our cultural independence as a part of Sony. And Sony was, had always been 100% in favor of that, always. And I think the challenge I had was in just explaining to Insomniac that, hey, look, Sony has walked the walk for you know, almost three decades with us. So it's, that's not going to change. Mm. And obviously people need to see it in action before they truly believe, but that has been literally what's happened. We, we are the same company that we have always been. We just are part of a larger ecosystem that's been awesome for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I should jump into this topic right now, but because uh, I don't know if you're very sensitive about it, but uh, I've noticed uh, on social media that sometimes you play in a band. <laughs> Where have you seen that on social media? Because I thought I successfully kept that off of social media. <laughs> we can edit it out later. If you don't want to talk about it. But I think on Facebook, I've seen pictures of you at Christmas parties playing a pretty confidently playing a guitar. Yeah, that's funny you say that. Well, yes, I am. I will. It, you don't have to cut this out. I... Prior to the pandemic, I was in a cover band and oh. for for many years, and we play in the town I live in and play. We were playing out to clubs, bars, maybe. Oh my gosh! Parties, etc. And we our our slogan really is uh, our slogan is we play music that drunk people will dance to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Yeah, and make the world a better place by playing music that drunk people will dance to. Oh yeah. I mean, that, that fits Insomniac's vision through and through, for sure. What are you called? Uh, I'm not going to say. You're not going to say? Cause people yeah. right now, you didn't even name the town. People obviously are all going to ch check their local calendars to see where this band is playing. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll warn people that we tended to, you know, we, we played, we for some reason, we tended to play a lot of holidays. So we would dress up uh, yeah. and or, or benefits or charity things. Elf costumes? We, yes, we were wearing <laughs> costumes. And the best... The best one for sure was when we dressed up as Kiss. Uh, oh yeah, because we, nice. we we had a few a couple members who were big Kiss fanatics, and we so we did the whole professional makeup thing. We got the Kiss costumes. I had the eight inch platform heels on. No way. Yeah, it was great. Oh, yeah. It was it was really fun. These pictures have to come out. That sounds like a <laughs> lot of the time. Did you do a whole Kiss set? A whole show? We played we played a couple Kiss songs. We play. Mostly, we play all rock music, and yeah. and I I sing and play guitar, and it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, but pandemic came, no more. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I just want to talk about Kiss now. Do you play uh, Strutter or uh, God of Thunder? I we should have played Strutter. We play uh, rock and roll all night, and oh my gosh, what's the other one? I'm totally blanking on now. Um, one of their other famous songs. So if you ever see a Kiss cover band in your town. Rush out and see if you can recognize Ted Price in his eight inch. Well, well, just to be fair, we're not a Kiss cover band. We are a a. I know, but so far that's all I have. That's the only lead I have to offer people. <laughs> I have to find you. Yeah, and it's it's so great because I would often joke about like we talked about like did you have a concept of being a video game professional when you were a kid and um and you and and uh a lot of us have these fantasies of being in a rock band when we're younger. You know, whether we dreamed of being a video game person is kind of in doubt, but most of us dreamed at one point of being able to shred a guitar on the stage in front of people. And there's a certain age, I think, you know, I, I think for me, I was really old and I was like, you know, I'm probably not going to be in that rock band that I thought about, you know, because you in the back of your hand, you're like, yeah, eventually I'll, you know, learn the drums. So I'll be in that rock band. You're like, I guess I'm not actually not. I guess I have a job. This is probably what I'm going to be doing. And I, I should probably stop thinking about how I'm eventually going to be in this rock band. But it for you that, that it actually happened. You're actually living the dream. Living the dream of playing to groups of 10 to maybe, maybe if we're lucky, a couple hundred people, maybe mostly small numbers of people. So that's the dream right there. What's but they like? were usually pretty, they were pretty enthusiastic because they were pretty inebriated. That was usually the best part. Yes. <laughs> they, you guys were probably really good. Five uh, bet. I assume it's still, it's all the founders of Insomniac up there playing. It's those brothers and, you know. <laughs> okay. So, so here's another crazy thing that happened early on. Uh, we built a music studio in our first office. We took a room that we weren't using. We bought a whole bunch of acoustic foam. 
uh, tacked it up on the walls. We bought a drum set and a couple of guitars and, you know, really nobody knew how to play music, but we, we went through the motions and it was, <laughs> it was awesome for about a week. And so See? yes and no, uh, <laughs> I mean, is the band all insomniac? No, 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 no. Uh, okay. actually our lead guitarist Turn. is a former insomniac and the other two are friends of mine who are from outside of insomniac. So, okay. I mean, that's just so similar. Like we had a little band room cause like you spend a lot of time when you're starting up, you know, in that same phase where you have a pool table, you know, and you, yes. you think you're going to use it all the time. And you like, you go through all these things like band, we, our band room was fun for a little while. And then you always need the space. You're like, well, we got to move in uh, the animators in there or something, you know, and then uh, the, the, the drum set ends up in a corner and, I know. That's great. I love the fact that you did that. Well, we for us, it was it was not the pool table at Insomniac. It was the ping pong table. Yep, yep, yep. That's the other one. Yes. And they, they move. I feel like every startup just has a job of moving that ping pong table to the next startup. They're like, yeah, we've had it for six months, and now everyone just piles paper on it. So we're, now here it is. You, you're a startup. Here's your ping pong table. <laughs> and you use them a lot for a week. You know, there's a big line. There's a sign-up list of, like, who can play pool next? And then... And then somehow you lose that. You forget well, that. I don't know about you guys, but what ended up killing the ping pong for us was Mario Kart. Uh, oh, yeah. Mario Kart, I can't, I don't remember what year the first one came out, but that ended up being the game that everybody played. And Al Hastings, uh, mm -hmm. who is our you know super guru at Insomniac, he had reverse engineered the game a long time ago and just basically won it i mean nobody could nobody could win against al it was i thought you meant you were playing a hacked version of it that he had somehow made <laughs> he, he had reverse engineered the game mechanics and oh, and wow. just knew exactly how to frame play by frame when to break and when to yeah yeah oh man that sounds dangerous was that, that yeah seven double fine it was hit by i think seven was the ds one the handheld one the first that was networking and you'd sit there oh. we'd all sit there in the kitchen and like um yes. play the handheld one but yeah oh, good times good times Okay, what have we not talked about? Games. Starting out. The band. Most importantly, we hit hit on the band. This is the only time I've ever talked publicly about the band, Tim. I'm, I'm, I think it's about time you came forward with that. I'm so inspired that you don't have to give up on your rock and roll dreams. I'm going to do it now. I'm going to, I'm going to start that band. What is your, what is your instrument of choice? Is it drums? It I've always liked the drums because it's really, they're, I mean, they're very hard to play well, but they're very easy to play badly. You know what I mean? Like it's really it's really easy to get in there and 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 do a basic thing and have a lot of fun playing them. So I I, I bought a drum set in uh, back when I was at Lucas still, and I was I took a couple lessons, oh. and we um started a um a little kitchen band with some friends from Day of the Tentacle and the other day, and we called ourselves Big Breakfast. My idea was like, if we call ourselves Big Breakfast, and then we're on tour and we show up anywhere, they'll always create a big breakfast for us. They'll be like, hey, we thought of this funny joke. We made you a really big breakfast because we like a big breakfast. So it hasn't paid off yet, but, but. I love that name. Band name. Naming the band is the hardest thing. It's like naming a game, right? Yeah. There's no, everybody hates the name at first other than the person who came up with it. And then eventually yeah. it's just, it just sounds perfect. I mean, Double Fine was supposed to be a band name. Like I would, um, drive, this is your interview. I don't tell my stories, but the, the, I was driving, I grew up in Sonoma, was an hour north of uh, San Francisco. And we would drive into San Francisco to see bands. And there's a sign on the Golden Gate Bridge that said double fine zone, slow to 45 miles an hour. Cause like, it's, it's a double fine zone. And I was like, wow, if you kind of had a band called Double Fine, people would think you bought this amazingly expensive billboard on the Golden Gate Bridge that, that says all of San Francisco is a double fine zone. And so we, uh, so around that age, when I was starting the company, I was like, I'm probably never going to have that band. Maybe I'll name a company that. And, uh, oh, and then, they, awesome. then they changed the sign. So it doesn't say that anymore. So now we're stuck with the name. I had no idea. I, I've i always thought of Double Fine as doubly great, right? That was sort of, I thought it yeah. was Double Fine was, that's what you meant. It was doubly fine or something. And it was sort of a play on words. I mean, it doesn't work that way, right? That That's also, that was the thought. Okay. So like that's penalty. But the but the double the double fine zone that's awesome. Yeah, you'll see that sign now all the time. And be like, oh wow, Tim, yes, parking space. <laughs> Guys, that's so cool. Well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so let me, I'll, I'll suggest for for an incentive to to get good at drums fast. One thing that we did at Insomniac that inspired a lot of people to to pick up and practice, pick up their instruments and practice was having a battle of the bands for oh, one wow. of our Christmas parties. Because mm -hmm. we do, I mean, like your point is that a lot of developers play music, 
right? It's yeah. one of those weird things. Music and martial arts, I think. I, I don't know why. <laughs> I was going to say it's about creativity, but it seems to be also about punching. I, I find a lot of a lot of developers are really into martial arts. So the but we did it must have been 15 years ago. And there were five bands at Insomniac who just came together over a love of shared genres. And we literally did a battle. It was awesome. It was fantastic. Wow. And we talk about yeah. it now as, in fact, we were talking about it as uh, talking about doing a revisit of that concept the year the pandemic hit last year. So mm -hmm. we're now pushing it off to some other future date. And did um, your band win the contest? I like to think that we did. Um, oh, you, didn't, you didn't pick a winner. You just all... We didn't. We we couldn't figure out a good way to judge the applause. It just wasn't. Mm -hmm. Nobody was objective, and you know, I I thought we won. We were. And everyone had a great time, probably. Yes, everybody had a great time. I think probably. Are there pictures um, of this event somewhere? You know. What? Okay, so this is the other thing that kills me. Somebody did take a video of it, and yeah. we Lost could never it. find it. I know, expected answer, but the video just didn't show up. So I I will tell you the name of that band that I played in with uh, other insomniacs who are still at insomniac sean mccabe dwight okahara paul mudra we were all part of a band called bladed justice because we figured that was the best name ever yeah for it is band. <laughs> and, and surprisingly i don't think there is a band named bladed justice out Isn't there that, that's that's hard to do to find yeah. something that has not been you know we had brutal legend and we'd try and google i would try and make a name so ridiculous that surely this has not been done like uh, Omen of Prophecy, I thought was a, a yeah. thing I wanted to do because it's so redundant, Omen of Prophecy. And I looked up like, no, I, usually it's a World of Warcraft guild. Like no matter what you think of, someone has named a World of Warcraft guild that name. So you cannot, but Bladed Justice. That's a, that's that, You're right. That should have been in, that should have been in Brutal Legend for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like, I, or I can see it on the cover of a comic book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, ha, uh, let's see. How, how, how did you... Uh, now that it's uh, you've been through the whole Hollywood experience, how do you feel about that? Uh, making a movie, right? The Ratchet. I will not. I will claim that we had nothing, very little to do with that. Uh, oh, really? We helped. We did our best to help out by providing assets and uh, lighting feedback. I think uh, Steve Ryder, one of our animators, had a lot to do with the helping out with the rigs and animation for Ratchet, yeah. and a former Insomniac, Todd Fixman, TJ Fixman. Uh, wrote the initial script and it, you know, like most Hollywood productions, it went through a lot of twists and turns and we were more observing than anything else and kind of biting our nails and going, I wonder how this is going to turn out. Yeah. And it turned out the way it turned out. So <laughs> I haven't seen, I haven't seen it yet, but so you did not get the Hollywood experience. You did not get driven around the limo and walk out onto a red carpet and uh, no. <laughs> get lured into uh, having an agent and and start your whole you're like i'm in a band i don't need this i thought you were asking that start. facetiously but no I, we really didn't i don't think any of us experienced any of that stuff and part of it was none of us are interested in it um yeah. not by a long shot and you've had i know because you've worked with jack black and and other folks who are part of the mainstream industry i know you've been more exposed i'm in a limo right now well, okay. We'll see. It paid off. <laughs> you know people. No. I don't. No, not I'm happy to say I don't. Uh, <laughs> I still, okay. I, I'll just I'll just share with you one of my pet peeves. I still, still will occasionally get calls from folks who work in Hollywood who are calling for their boss. And it's the assistant calling me saying, we'd really like you to consider making a game about our, a game based on IP. <laughs> I'd like to set up a call with you and and my boss, who is the assistant producer for this IP. Uh, and then I think in the past, I, obviously I, I blow those off today, but in the past we had a few of those convert. I'd have a few of those conversations just to find out what they really wanted. And usually they would reschedule three or four times when they're the ones asking me yeah. to have the meeting. And that and we all joke about that insomniac. Like that's the insomniac. That's sorry. That's the Hollywood way yeah. that you just gotta live with and I, i'm assuming i like how they, they called you like we want you to make a game of our ip and you were like thank god i was just sitting here with no ideas <laughs> i was just going like i know how to program but i don't know what to program and because often it's a you, you'll get this call from oh they're from and they'll name some agency or some uh production studio that's very famous and you're like right. oh my god i'm getting called from you know de niro's studio or something and then and then later you won't be till you actually went through the motions you found out oh this was actually like an intern who started there, who thought, who was trying to put together something, but they don't have the other person's 
approval either. So they, they maybe they rescheduled that meeting because they didn't have the other person on the line. They're like, anyway, we could talk about the the ups and downs of Hollywood. Every, I mean, every time we've interacted with um, Hollywood, it's kind of made me really feel lucky to work in games, even yeah. though games is a crazy up and down industry. Like every, um, I we've been lucky that I think most of the projects we've started, we've finished, right? We've yeah, you know, we've we worked and made them, we brought them to market, right? We shipped. And um, I had so many lunches that has sounded so exciting, like something really amazing was going to happen. And then it's just poof, it's just gone. Like they, they start a lot more things than they, than they finish. Yeah, which is so weird to me because the game, games are the opposite of that. I mean, yeah, we have a lot of ideas and yeah, we, we brainstorm forever on stuff. But it feels to me that in this industry, when we make a decision to move ahead on something, we do it and we, and we just charge. That's the the experience I love about being in games. Yeah. 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 Oof. Um, anyway, <laughs> Hollywood is such a crazy, it's a crazy thing. Yeah. You know what? I will also say though, that when you get past that, that sort of the low, the folks who are trying to create opportunities for their bosses, when you actually talk to the folks who are in charge, we, we've had really yeah. good experiences. Like Spielberg actually showed up and, and checked out Sunset Overdrive years ago oh. at the Microsoft booth. And, and that was, that was really cool. Uh, yeah. to, he's a super nice guy. Uh, Conan O'Brien showed mm -hmm. up and hung out with Drew Murray, who was our game director on Sunset Overdrive. And just, again, super down to earth, yeah. funny dude. And that's the funny thing. Like people talk about the glitz and the glamour of Hollywood, like this very superficial thing, but all the people we've actually managed to work with, like, like Jack, you mentioned in, uh, um, Elijah Wood and these people who, you know, or some of the, the rock stars that we got for Brutal Legend, when you get down to the creative person who's famous, they're often just like, just like you, a creative person that wants to put on a show and entertain people. You yeah. know, they just like, what can we do? They just like, what can we do with this character? What can we do? Like, what kind of fun this show can we put on for people? And it's the same impulse. And then it's just surrounded by a lot more uh, strange uh, culture of, of lunches that, uh, you know, <laughs> maybe it's not strange when you live in it, but uh no, I agree. Back. It's it 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 highlights the difference between our industries and uh, the two industries. And I also I often when I get asked by by folks who maybe don't know much about games, if they're anything like the movie industry, I I usually answer, well, we focus on building companies that are that last, that are here Ooh. for the teams, like that that where the teams stay and participate and and make it their home and their family for years and years and years and years. Yep, yep, yep. Right. And that is so different from it's Hollywood. A very different model. But it's it's re certainly rewarding. I mean, I love talking to hanging out with insomniacs who have been around forever. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also love meeting new insomniacs, folks who who will join and go, wow, this per this person I'm sitting next to has been here for 20 years. That's cool. And and I think to myself, yeah, that's the kind of that's the culture we want where people yeah feel like this is their home. This is, if they have a problem, they can get answers. We can solve it. And yeah, they're going to be ups and downs, but uh, this is, this is long-term. Yeah. Have you ever, um, I think that's, that's amazing. And that's, that sounds like great. So have you ever had, uh, cause we have a very similar situation and um, have you ever had a, any sort of clash between those generations of people? Because a lot of times you bring in new ideas and people, some people, especially something that's grown up organically, they're like, well, this is how we do it. This is yeah. how we've always done it. And if you've done it for a long enough time, you often have forgotten why you do it that way. But you're just like, I have these instincts and this is how we do it. And you, it, sometimes it, it is useful to have someone question why you do things that way. You're like, why do we? That is an excellent question. And I'm glad, you, I'm glad you asked it because one of the things I struggle with is when I hear somebody say, this is the insomniac way, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm very much not interested in having doctrine. Like this is the insomniac way because it implies that there's, so either something somebody's doing wrong, right? Or there is some secret mystical set of guidelines that everybody has to follow that you only get to know if you've been there for 10 years, right? Yeah. And that's BS. That is not, that is not cool. We as a company, and I'm, I'm sure Double Fine is exactly the same way. We're always evolving, mm -hmm. right? And the reason we can evolve is because we have a lot of new folks who are joining us all the time who bring in experiences from outside the company. And they say, well, you guys are doing it this way and it's kind of inefficient. I've learned a different approach. Can we try it? And if the answer is no, nope, sorry, man, got to do it the insomniac way. That's, that is such, that's depressing and it's, it, it's <laughs> and it's demoralizing. So I've been 
asking people to not say those things and to be continue to be open to new ideas. And I think that's what propels us, right? especially as all of us have to grapple with new hardware and audiences that are changing as well. Like if we're not willing to change ourselves like every single day, then we're going to get left behind. Yeah, definitely. I try to be nimble and grow. The 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 uh, the flip side of that, a little risk that comes to my mind sometimes is that, you know, there, there are industry standards and then there is the way that we do things internally and some things we do do differently than the industry does at mm -hmm. large. And I feel like um, they're not necessarily rules set in stone, but, you know, we might make prioritize things differently than uh, another another company might. And I don't want to lose those things by just adopting what's the standard in the industry. Like someone might, new, might come from a large publisher and be like, well, here's how we do this. And, and I do, I do want to protect, um, cause sometimes the, they're not that it's a mystical thing, but they do, there is sometimes a secret sauce that you don't know why it works. And so it, it is worthwhile to examine why you think it works and, or really get down to the value you're trying to protect ultimately. Or like, well, like, if I'm trying to protect creativity, which is a big thing, you know, for our company is like, you know, sometimes that, that leads to a, a certain process that protects that value for goes back to the things you're saying about the values that Insomniac has. So you, you, you do want to change and evolve, but you don't want to throw out what makes Insomniac special accidentally because you didn't realize it was special till it was gone. Yeah, I agree. I, there's a, it's a balance to be achieved. And I think your point about having a, relying on your vision or your mission statement is useful. I think also from a game perspective, having pillars for each of your games, or you might call them something else, X Factor yeah. or something like that. No, nope, that's and, it. Okay, pillars. And being able to refer back to them consistently and, and to evaluate ideas. Also, we found is a great tool to take the emotion out of a lot of the arguments that mm -hmm. crop up every single time you talk about an idea. Uh, and remembering those like, and using those as your guide stars can be helpful too. Uh, yeah. You, you seem to have successfully taken the emotion out of, like when we talk about feedback from your team, you don't seem to take it very personally. And, I, <laughs> <laughs> and that's a challenge. It's always a challenge for me because like in some ways you are kind of one with the company. In the early days, like the first few days, first few years of the company, when someone quit, it was like very, it was like a personal rejection. And I don't, I, I've, you know, grown more used to that, you know, as years go by, but have you always been uh, able to compartmentalize or distance yourself, not take things personally when people are, offering that feedback and what do you think, what experience did you have that like made you prone to um, being open to feedback in an unemotional way? That is a great question. And I have absolutely not been able to separate my emotion <laughs> from, from feedback uh, in the past. And I got, I would get really upset early mm -hmm. on. I, you know, one of, I would call my, one of my most cherished mentors is Mark Cerny. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, Mark is awesome. He has done so much for insomniac. He's done so much for me, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of his, you know, his imparting his wisdom, but there were times where he and I would butt heads early on and my ego would get in the way of hearing what he would have to say. I, I'll, all I would hear was you're doing this wrong. You're, this is not right. What are you thinking? Where he was really saying, I want to help you. Uh, here's some suggestions to make the game better, to improve production. And as I moved on, I would sometimes react the same way to what insomniacs were saying, because I would, I had this fear of being stupid and being perceived as stupid. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, people were saying, well, I don't agree with this, or I feel like we should do something else. I early on would think, well, this, they must think I'm a moron because yeah. this thing that I proposed was, was great. It works. So why are you criticizing it? But it took me a long time. What, what helped getting over that was actually stepping out of the creative director position <laughs> and, yeah. and, and focusing more on, you know, turning, turning my focus to what I should have been focused on all along. And that was just the insomniacs and, you know, what insomniacs are feeling and whether or not they're having a good experience at the company. But that still took a long, it took a long time to get to the point where I, I could take constructive criticism myself in a way that wasn't destructive. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and part of it was also feeling responsible for the company and understanding that the decisions that I made, especially the mistakes I made, which I continue to make every single day, um, have a larger than normal impact on the lives of insomniacs. And so, uh, acknowledging that I would make, that I'd make mistakes, uh, felt like I was acknowledging that I was steering insomniac in the wrong direction and, mm -hmm. and impacting people negatively. And I had to get comfortable with the fact that nobody's perfect and, 
you know, by actually acknowledging mistakes, I'm potentially more approachable for people who would normally be terrified to say something to me that I'm an idiot or whatever yeah. they wanted to say. <laughs> and I don't mind. If somebody calls me an idiot today, I'm cool with that because <laughs> I admit that I do a lot of idiotic things. Yeah. So I'd like to minimize the percentage of my idiocy. And if other people can help me with that, great. Yeah. That's like, I had a similar feeling when uh, people talk about imposter syndrome a lot. And I, I've, you know, I had that question when people bring up feedback, you're like, am I bad? Am I just, should I just quit? Should I let someone else do it? And you know, that everyone has that kind of feeling. And then I, I realized like, I mean, I probably am screwing this thing up. And there's this part that someone else could do better. But overall, if you swapped in a different person, it would just be a different set of mistakes. It would really yeah. just be. And in that way, yeah, we all are, we are imposters. Like all of us are, are imposters because nobody's perfect. And we all make these terrible mistakes. And I'm probably doing as good a job as at least half the people out there, maybe more. But <laughs> I, so I might as well keep doing it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, here's the thing, Tim. If you're if if you are passionate about it, right, then that's that's. I feel like 80% of the battle because yeah, we're all going to do make mistakes, but it's that passion, right? It's that excitement about helping people in your, on your team, you know, overcome creative obstacles and solve problems. That's, that means more than anything. And if you're, if your track record is 50, 50 on, on the suggestions you make, great, whatever, but yeah. people get fired up because of you, right? Because of what yeah. you say and your attitude. And that's, that makes all the difference, I think. Yeah. And I think sometimes I think, you know, when they, when we thought we might not survive, I'm like, well, we were around for X number of years and we did pay people and we got their health insurance covered and we, you know, we made some fun games, you know, like anyway, but uh, here we are not dead. Both of our companies doing well and uh, surviving. That's why I think it's so uh, really come to appreciate in this industry that can be really hard on folks. Uh, there's a company like Insomniac where someone is dedicated to the quality of life of of everyone there, right? And I think that's a great model for for everyone's company because um, it's harsh out there in the in the yeah. industry, and uh, you've got a, a great a great thing going on there. Thanks, Tim. I'm I'm still again making mistakes every day, and I, but I appreciate I appreciate <laughs> what you're saying. I it's I, we're still figuring it out, and I think we will never stop figuring it out, right? Just that's that's the hard thing to realize. Being a detail oriented perfectionist, I, I which I try to not be, but I can be, is that no matter how hard or how smart we think we are, how hard we try to solve these problems, there's always another one right around the corner. And as long as our teams and we can have patience with you know, each other, um, we'll get there, right? It's, it's yeah. the, I think it's when we lose patience and with each other and we don't give each other the benefit of the doubt that things spiral into that sort of bitter state where people go throw their hands up and they go, well, it's just inevitable. I'm going to, you know, things are going to go badly. And, and, you know, I think a lot of our, your job and my job is to, is to remind people that, no, it's going to be okay. Uh, as long as we're, we have, you know, we're focusing on the things that really matter <laughs> and, yeah. and, and we can, and you participate in the solutions, it's going to be okay. And, and we'll get there. And that's, I think that's part of the longevity formula for, for Double Fine, for Insomniac, and for other companies like us. We, we've always believed that we could get there. And that that get there place keeps on stretching out, you know, a few more miles every year. <laughs> but it's still there, right? We're still, yeah. we're still getting there. <laughs> and people are still coming with us. And that's great. Oh, my gosh. Wise words. Very inspirational. I feel like those are great words to end on because I feel all inspired to go uh, write a bunch of notes down on how to improve my company. So that's great. Thank you, Ted. Hey, man. Thank you, Tim. This is a lot of fun. This has been a lot, a lot of fun. fun. Thanks for all the great. I'll return the microphone to you so you can continue doing these great interviews with other folks. Um, so thank you for letting me jump in here and pretend to be the host for a little while. You're a great host, man. You should do this. I, you don't need me. Oh, I, this is how it starts with you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, because you've always been involved. You with, would be awesome doing this, Tim. You, you've given your time to AIS right a, a lot, and and I remember complaining about something in the awards early on, like why can't I'm I was, and you're like, well, you know, if you want to improve that, you could volunteer. And I was like, wait, wait a second, what have I stepped into here? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, no one expects no one sees what ted's doing until it's too late That's and now hilarious. you got a, a new job <laughs> now i'll let y'all let you continue to do it thank you ted thanks, thanks everybody Tim. for listening is that how you end the show how do you usually end it just like that that was perfect see Great. you're you're natural we're probably That's already cool. over they probably cut this stuff they're not going to use this stuff <laughs> all right thanks ted bye everybody <laughs>
Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.